Oh, uh, well. <laughs> so, uh, just so that you know where we are going, um, where I want to end with in about 30 minutes is a um, discussion of uh, something called the power factor. I think your textbook also talks about it too. Um, and uh, this is something to be aware of in engineering applications, and particularly in industrial settings where people are running, let's say, large motors. So you're driving large inductive loads, or like large may not be the right word. You're driving inductive loads that require uh, large amounts of current. And um, if you are not careful, there's ways where you can be wasting a lot of power. So there are some considerations that people um, use, and uh, I think there's a compensate. Mm, I think this is where I want to just do compensation, just do Google search. Um, and power factor correction. So I want to just uh, uh, briefly cover that. And I don't know. I thought Wikipedia covered this a little bit. Uh, correction? Yeah, uh, power factor correction of linear loads. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is what it's uh, talking about. And it's the kind of thing that electrical engineers would uh, uh, consider. And uh, that's where I want to end that in about 30 minutes or so. So let me uh, build uh, up the rest of discussion of power in AC circuit in this way. So we are still talking about power dissipated in AC circuit. Um, so um, the thing that makes it AC is a sinusoidal driving voltage, or I'm gonna write it in the complex representation for you know, e to the i omega t. And I want to make it interesting um, in the sense that, so, well, um, let me try this version first. I want to make it interesting, but I don't want to make it too interesting. <laughs> or, you know, I want to try to keep it simple. So in an effort to keep it simple, I'm going to have a single uh, component. And here, let me have a very unrealistic single component, which is a single inductor. It's uh, um, not quite realistic to have. Uh, I think it, this was covered in one of your conceptual questions. And the reason I say, um, just voltage source inductor circuit is unrealistic is that, um, you know, inductors bound to have some resistance in the wires and whatnot. But, let, you know, let, let's say we are living in theoretical world and <laughs> I can build a circuit, maybe it's a superconducting wire. Um, so, so the idea of complex impedance introduced earlier makes this analysis a super simple. So this inductor, it has an impedance associated with it that's represent, represented by I omega t. By the way, uh, what I do is, for those of you who might be taking electrical engineering courses later, what I do is a little bit different. What we physicists do is usually somewhat different from what electrical engineers do, which is that I use lowercase i to mean imaginary number. And I never use it for current. When I mean current, I will be using capital I. Um, in electrical engineering, I guess for some reason they use lowercase i for current often. So uh, they would use that for to mean current and lowercase j to replace that. So that's a convention that you may see in the future. I'm not gonna use that convention. My lowercase i's are imaginary numbers and my uppercase i's are always current. So, okay. So uh, I said the analysis of this was simple. And um, if you are, imagine applying Ohm's law, which says that current is the voltage divided by resistance and impedances work like resistances. Then this current induced through this circuit should look like the time dependent voltage divided by the impedance of the circuit. And that exactly gives you the answer. Um, so let me just write it out here. It's uh, uh, so V naught divided by I omega T times 
e to the i omega t. Let me rewrite this a little bit because I think written in this way, it's a little bit, um, doesn't bring out all the meanings here that's in a way that's really easy to see. So let me rewrite a current as a complex function here. Um, so um, let me write down all the real coefficients first, V naught over omega t. And I'm gonna have e to the i omega t in the end. And let me do something about this one over i. So one over i is equal to minus i. Uh, to see that equality, you just multiply to i. Both of them will give you one because i squared is minus one, minus one times one, minus is one. One over i times i gives you one. So, so one over i there, that's really minus i. But even that is a bit, um, it doesn't quite bring out the full meaning of this uh, imaginary factor. So I want to write this in what appears to be unnecessarily complex way. I am going to write it this way, e to the, uh, I three pi over two. I mean, are they even equal to each other? Well, let's check. So use Euler's formula. This thing expression better be equal to cosine of three pi over two plus I sine of three pi over two. Um, cosine, so, you know, this is my thing. Um, so pi is this, three pi over two is this angle. Oh uh, yeah, cosine of that is zero. And uh, sine of that is this component here, so minus one. So yeah, so that is equal to um, zero plus minus one times i, minus i. So, so I'm gonna replace this uh, number with that, uh, e to the, um, e to the i three pi, over two, and you can see why I'm writing it <laughs> into something that actually looks more complicated, because now I can do exponential algebra to combine these two exponential terms. So my final expression has this form of real coefficient um, that you can actually get easily by going through the same thing your textbook does, you know, voltage divided by magnitude of impedance times this uh, a complex exponential, which contains both the information about the time dependent uh, oscillation and here for the first time today, phase factor. So it's going to look like e to the i omega t, that's the oscillating part, plus three pi over two, that's the phase factor. Or I, I guess, um, Technically, the way that's more commonly written is actually uh, minus pi over two. Both of them give you the same quantity because if you are going counterclockwise three pi over two, you can go clockwise pi over two. So, so this is phase factor. And this is what tells you that the current through the inductor, I think the correct term is it lags the voltage. Um, but I always get those languages mix, mixed up. What I never get mixed up is this mathematical expression because that comes straight from Ohm's law. So, so, so this is the expression for the current through the circuit. It's, uh, um, it's out of phase. It's not, so when you plot the current and voltage through this circuit, this is what you're going to get. So let me imagine that I'm taking the, um, that I'm taking the real part of the voltage and the current function. So the voltage part will look like a cosine. It's gonna um, do something like this. And the current part, oh, I guess I better write this out. So it's a cosine of omega t minus pi over two. And then there's the imaginary part that I'm throwing away. Uh, let me rewrite this using cosine angle addition formula. It's a cosine of omega t times cosine of pi over two, oops, that's zero. So that's gonna be, whole thing's gonna be zero. Uh, plus, because that's minus, uh, sine of omega t times um, sine of pi over two. This is one. So sine of omega t. Oh, so the current will just look like 
So if I plot the current, it'll just look like a sinusoidal thing. Yeah, uh, sorry, where it's a zero, it should be maximum. And then, you know, zero so should mature with the maximum. So, okay, something like that. So, yeah, so the current is out of phase with the voltage. And um, I wonder if uh, I can get this result. Um, yeah, so this is why I wanted to talk about uh, I want you to talk about uh, current through um, or power dissipated in AC circuit, because this is where I think if you're simply following mathematical formalism, you can get lost and uh, meaning of um, meaning of the mathematical expressions isn't quite clear. So, um, so I think uh, it's a uh, easier to start with the answer. Um, so let me just uh, start with the answer here uh, for, the, for this particular question. Uh, the question being, what is the average power dissipated in a circuit? And that's something I can actually attempt to answer by using this uh, representation here, because you know, these are all real functions. So if I'm doing average over time, that's better give me um, average power in the circuit. And I hope um, as you consider these expressions, you know, uh, voltage goes as cosine of omega t, that the uh, current goes as sine of omega t, that I hope you know enough trick to know that if I have cosine of omega t times the sine of omega t, and I'm uh, averaging this over long time, zero to t or zero to capital T, one over t, that this whole quantity is gonna be zero. Um, you can prove it, you know, um, use, yeah, <laughs> there are ways to prove it, but let me just uh, make that assertion. Um, and you can kind of see it in the graph here. The These two are not in phase, so you can see a portion here. So up to this portion here, your power is positive. And from here to here, your power is negative. Whatever that means, uh, you know, it could mean that you are putting power back into the energy source or whatever. And from here to here, your wait, um, yeah, yeah, negative times negative. So here your power is positive again, and you can kind of get intuitively from this graph that yeah, that positive and negative flux, uh, oscillating power expression, it's gonna average out to zero, and it does. Um, so, so that's the answer I want you to start from, that when you average power in a circuit like this, that average power consumption is zero. And I hope that makes uh, intuitive sense because this circuit contains no, um, no dissipative uh, component. Inductor, when it's perfect, it only stores energy and releases energy, you know, in the form of magnetic fields. <laughs> but it only stores and releases energy. It never, um, it, it, uh, even though um, the, this expression that current the complex current is voltage divided by Z, even though that looks like Ohm's law, certain aspect of Ohm's law isn't there because Ohm's law always relied on some kind of power dissipation in the element. But, you know, inductor, you know, it comes from Faraday's law and it involves, you know, um, power energy dissipation. It only involves transfer of energy from power source to the magnetic field in the inductor. So I hope uh, when you get the answer that average power dissipated in this circuit is zero, that it makes intuitive sense. And uh, this is where I want to caution you when you are, um, so knowing that correct answer, <laughs> that I hope that uh, knowledge of correct answer guides you as you 
um, as you apply, um, as you do further circuit analysis and as you answer certain questions. So let me imagine making this circuit a little bit more complicated, maybe in an attempt to, to model the inductor better, or maybe my inductor is a motor and I have long power transmission line and I'm interested in um, just the whole thing, transmission line plus the motor. In order, to, what you do need to do to do that kind of modeling is to say, all right, um, instead of saying that this circuit has only one component that is the inductor, I need to have inductor and I need to have a register model. And in certain aspects, uh, this is a super easy thing to uh, modify our calculation for. And this is why I introduced the complex exponentials or the, the complex impedance. Because once I have a register, the register has some impedance that's actually just the resistance. <laughs> and uh, these two elements, the impedances, they behave like resistances in almost uh, uh, many, well, in most cases, one exception being when you're dealing with the power. <laughs> um, so in order to uh, include this register in your analysis, all you have to do deal with, all you have to treat this circuit as is, all right, so it's a two component, two series uh, component circuit. So I need to calculate my um, equivalent impedance that's gonna be sum of these two. So I omega, I wrote T there. It should have been I omega L <laughs> inductance. <laughs> uh, so equivalent impedance is gonna be impedance of the inductor plus impedance of the register R. All right, that's my equivalent impedance, complex impedance. And my current will simply be application of this formula. My current as a function of time is going to be uh, my time divided by impedance, the equivalent impedance. Oh, I guess not as a function of time. So it's going to be V naught e to the i omega t <laughs> divided by uh, this thing, uh, r plus i omega l. And uh, you can see that some aspect of this will be complicated as in, um, so when I have a complex number like one over R plus I omega L, um, this is, I can, I guess I can rationalize it. Um, so I can rationalize it to rewrite it into this Cartesian form. Um, and when I do that, <laughs> I'll have this common factor that multiplies R squared plus omega squared L squared. And then I have this R minus um, I omega L. And so, you know, I have this, uh, this times this as the real part, this times this as the imaginary part. And there's that Cartesian representation and there's also this uh, um, this uh, polar representation, and I'm just going to give you the expression without proving it. And the expression is this: one over square root of r squared plus omega squared l squared times. So this is the magnitude of that, or absolute value squared uh, square root, <laughs> or absolute value of the complex number times e to the the, the phase factor. And um, I guess I can write down this much. The phase factor phi, it's given by tangent of phi is the, the ratio of the imaginary part of the complex number divided by the real part of the same complex number. So, um, so the you know, expression for phi in a case like this, it's gonna be a little complicated. That's why I want to just write it as phi, knowing that I can always get what it is. So, Using this here, <laughs> I can rewrite my current into this form, um, the magnitude or the amplitude of current oscillation, which is going to be V naught divided by square root of R squared plus omega squared L squared times. And this oscillatory portion will have a phase factor, e to the i omega t, and then it'll have this phi. 
um, yeah, the philosophy. So I wrote it in such a way that, yeah, so it, it, phi is likely gonna be negative, but uh, so, but you know, I'm just adding phi here. So, so yeah, that's the expression for current as a function of time. And in some sense, there's nothing simpler. It's just, all right, um, that, that kind of the same thing I would have done if uh, this were an indoc uh, register instead of an inductor. The only additional complication I had to go through dealt with a complex number, uh, which is the price we pay for this uh, being such a simple thing to analyze when you use complex exponentials and complex impedances. And you can even use this to do certain calculations. You can do this calculation. You can calculate. Um, you can calculate power dissipated in register. That calculation I can still perfectly do in the AC circuit context, and all I have to do is this. So, um, so from our earlier discussion. Really the only thing I can get at is the average power. The, the instantaneous power takes too much effort. I'm not gonna do that. But I can get to the average power dissipated in register. And that's going to have this form that average power is gonna be um, the average of the current squared times the resistance, because this is constant. And with the complex exponentials here, this can be written in a very simple way. That's simply the, the, the complex function conjugate times the complex function itself divided by two. That's what gives you the time average. Multiply that to R. And let me just finish out this calculation. I have this expression for the current. Um, you know that when I do conjugate times the complex function, this. Uh, uh, exponential here is gonna disappear. So this uh, product here is simply going to be the coefficient squared. So it's gonna be um, V naught squared over, well, so R squared plus omega squared L squared. And then I have the remaining factors of R over two. So that's the power dissipated in register. And all right, uh, that, um, I guess uh, one way you can convince, uh, the, convince yourself is if you imagine the inductance going to zero or omega going to zero, both of which will make inductor like a wire. When you do that, it, this should uh, reduce it down to V naught squared over two R. And that's what you'd expect, V naught squared over R from before. And the factor of one half from averaging cosine squared omega t. So, so it, th this is a sensible expression. And yeah, you can do that and that's perfectly fine. That will give you the right answer and <laughs> there's nothing for you to worry about. Um, the thing that if you tried to do would uh, give you an expression that really should give you a pause and it's uh, this, which is, um, let's say you, let's say imagine a version of you or version of this class where I forgot to go through this discussion. And I gave you a homework assignment like that. And so now you're computing the power dissipated in an inductor. Let me attempt to do that. So I say, all right, power dissipated in inductor. And I somehow remember or think that, oh, I can have this formula here and just uh, use the impedance of the inductor instead of resistance. And if I do it correctly, <laughs> it'll look like this. I'm gonna be writing down the power average is equal to, all right, I need the current squared average times the impedance of the inductor. So uh, I know how to handle this, like I know how, how to deal with the complex numbers. And so I do complex conjugate times complex function itself divide by two times the impedance. That's gonna be I, not omega T, but omega L. So not dependent on time, that's fine. And when you finish calculation, this is what you're going to get. Uh, v naught squared over R squared plus omega squared L squared 
times i omega l and uh, i hope he, if you ever do this that you are observant enough to notice this i and i hope that makes you worry because power is supposed to be a, a real quantity and so you know here you are not supposed to need to do anything like taking the real part like it was already expected to be real. But because the impedance of the inductor is imaginary, the calculation here doesn't give you a real quantity. And what this is telling you is that, um, or I guess you can pretend that you needed to take real power. But I think about what's more better, less to take away from this is that inductor doesn't dissipate power. So um, there's no such a thing as power dissipated in an inductor. Inductor doesn't dissipate power you can only really calculate power dissipated in register. And you, when you calculate that, you do it the normal way you would if you're just dealing with the DC circuit, just with some details about complex numbers that you uh, have learned. Um, if someone asks you how much power is dissipated in doctor, you say zero without even needing to calculate it. And if someone asks you, what's the power dissipated in capacitor, you say zero. You don't even need to calculate it. And if you were to attempt a calculation like this, then, um, then, um, um, then, um, <laughs> then, then this uh, imaginary thing will uh, hopefully tip you off that something's wrong here. Um, you look up whatever reference you need to, to realize that, oh, there's no such thing as power dissipated in doctor. Um, if uh, you know there's a power dissipated in real motor, then it's dissipated in the portion that's modeled as register, resistance of the motor. So, so um, what I wanted to end here is um, kind of a scenario and a scenario that um, that can help um, us to figure something out. And I guess um, I need to construct this, this correctly. So let's see. So I want you to imagine a device that consists almost entirely of something that has inductance, like a motor. I think motor is what I want you to think about. And uh, I want you to imagine that this uh, resistance is relatively small, that uh, much smaller compared to omega L. And, um, and the motor typically needs certain amount of voltage of V0 to operate. Okay. Um, the scenario I'm trying to build up here is, is this. So right now with this circuit, this is the expression that you have for power dissipated. Let me, um, let's see, let me rewrite it this way. Um, so I'm going to rewrite it as V naught squared over R times uh, I basically, or 2R times, what I basically done is uh, multiply top and bottom by, um, by R, um, uh, by one over R squared. So one over R squared cancels out one factor of R, it leaves up a factor of R here. Um, that's what I have there. And the multiplying the denominator here by one over R squared will give me one over one plus omega squared L squared over R squared. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a, uh, let's see, is that a, hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a probably good starting place. So, just to have uh, some sense of numbers, uh, what I want you to kind of assume is that V0 is relatively large and R is relatively small. And with the stipulation, I hope you see that um, this quantity here is then, um, 
it's then relatively large if this, uh, um, well, I mean, you know, this coefficient is a relatively large quantity. And the um, thing that um, causes you a bit of an issue is this omega squared L squared. And I think how I want to specify that is, is that, um, do I want it to be relatively small? You know, let me just make this easy for myself and just to say, uh, say this, omega L is equal to R. Because uh, I keep wanting this to be small, but let me just say omega L is equal to R. <laughs> Under that scenario, this numerical factor is one over two. And what you see here is that there's a fairly large power dissipation in this resistance R, which is only incidental to this setup. So this whole device, it mostly has inductance and this R could be the, um, it, it could be the, the resistance of the wire. And um, so there's a, a lot of power that, uh, that, uh, uh, that's uh, wasted on the wire and yeah, yeah, <laughs> let me leave that there. And and, and th this is and this is the uh, scenario where the power factor is uh, the, but the Wikipedia article was describing as when power factor is a high. And uh, what I want to describe now is the modification that can be made to the circuit to remedy this uh, situation that a lot of power is being uh, being dissipated in the um, in the register. And it really comes from the fact that um, this circuit draws more, more current than it needs to. So this is how I'm going to modify it. Uh, I had some time to think this through, but not exactly to work out. So I hope I'm modifying it the correct way. And I think the way to modify it is this way. I'm going to add a capacitor in parallel with the inductor. So it's either parallel or series. And I think a series actually makes it worse, I, I think. <laughs> so <laughs> let me do it parallel. And if it doesn't work, then I'll go back and do a series. <laughs> um, so when I add an inductor in parallel, then not the inductor capacitor in parallel to the inductor, then this is now what I have to do. Um, this, so let me erase all this. I'm just gonna rewrite it um, with the modified version. Yeah, so the, the impedance of the capacitor is given by one over I omega C. Uh, I tried to write this so that my C is not confusing compared to L. And um, I analyze this uh, like any three register circuit where two of them are parallel and one of them is in series to that parallel thing. So I will need to add this first to get my, let's label it G1. So my G1 is gonna be computed this way. One over G1 is equal to uh, one over GL plus one over GC or let me write it all in, one over I omega L plus uh, reciprocal of that, I omega C. Uh, let me try to combine these two. Um, factor out I, um, so omega C, and then factoring out I from here should give me minus one, uh, minus one over omega L. And um, if I wanted to, Simplify this a little bit more. It'll look like I times um, omega squared LC. That's the, this term multiplied uh, up and down by omega L <laughs> minus this numerator here, one divided by omega L. Okay, so that's my, um, or the reciprocal of that. <laughs> so my T1 is minus I omega L divided by 
omega squared LC minus one. And this uh, quantity has uh, certain properties. Uh, let me just uh, highlight some of those properties. It, uh, uh, it, it's a frequency dependent. So if you imagine a regime where frequency of your circuit is very low, so that the impedance of the inductor is low and impedance of capacitor is high, then this combination should look kind of more or less like um, more or less like impedance of inductor. And if you imagine omega going, if you imagine omega approaching zero, then um, then the, this omega squared in the denominator goes to zero more quickly. The denominator kind of looks like a minus one, minus cancels that, so G1 uh, kind of, before it completely goes to zero, it goes to I omega L, which is sort of what you'd expect. And, um, and you know, if you are, if you imagine where this goes to a high frequency, so that the impedance of uh, uh, inductor is very high and the impedance of capacitor is very low, then if you work out all the math, a G of one should go like, uh, one over i omega c again before it completely goes to zero. This uh, quantity has a very special property. Um, as uh, omega goes to one over l c square rooted, as in when this uh, combination of factors approaches one, g of one approaches infinity. It looks like an open circuit here. In some sense, inductor and capacitor cancel each other out. Um, and it's really, and you know, when you are installing capacitor here for a particular purpose in mind, actually this frequency will be your operating frequency, or rather, I guess you pick your capacitance values so that uh, this uh, uh, condition is true at your operating frequency precisely with the intent of making G1 approach infinity or make it, make, make it infinity. So with this modification, my equivalent impedance is equal to, so I'm just gonna use G1 as an expression. It's gonna be my, um, actually, let me, let me do it this way. Uh, let me write all this as, eh, let me, I'll just leave it G1 as it is. Um, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> let me say this quantity here is minus I G1. So when I say, when I use the letter G1, it'll be simply referring to this uh, combination here, which is real. So my equivalent impedance of this whole thing is gonna be the impedance of the register R plus the impedance of this combination, which is minus I G1 and with that complex impedance, the current through the circuit will be the applied voltage, so complex, divided by the equivalent impedance. Or if I'm interested in just um, time average of the current squared, then the way you would calculate it is this way. You calculate it by um, the complex conjugate of V T divided by T complex conjugate of the equivalent resistance times the original thing divided by G equivalence. And the numerator portion is simply gonna give me V naught squared over two. That's the calculation I've done a few times now. It, that's what I'm gonna get divided by, and this calculation, G complex conjugate times G self is gonna give me, let me do it on the side here. It's uh, R plus I G1, that this is why I want you to define G1 as positive or a uh, real times, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, um, R minus I G1. And when you go through the algebra here, what you are going to get is R squared plus the T1 squared. So my average um, I squared is R squared plus T1 squared. And this is 
what I want you to see under this condition goes to yeah, G1, uh, the real value um, or the absolute value of G1 goes to infinity. So, um, so when this condition holds, what, uh, what you're going to see for this current to flow out of the, out of the power source, current or the, the average power square uh, or average of current squared is going to go to zero. Meaning uh, when I do this power dissipated in register calculation and multiply it by resistance, this is gonna be vanishingly small. There will be much less current flowing through the register and, um, and very little power will be wasted in the register here. And so then you might ask, uh, then does it, doesn't that simply mean this uh, inductive load or motor is not, um, it's not receiving as much, um, I mean, so if uh, average current power out of the power supply is zero, then how does it, you know, how does this work? If you, if you do repeat the analysis, for not the total current, but simply for the current through the inductor, then you will find that um, the I squared value of this is not actually approaching zero. And what you basically have is there's a circulating current here. Current kind of circulates between capacitor and inductor. And this current never has to cross this register, so it doesn't uh, waste any power. And, and this is the principle or reason behind the power factor correction. That if you have an inductive load, I, we are used to saying large inductive load. And I think by large inductive load, we really mean a kind of inductive load that would draw large current. <laughs> so, and that usually sometimes actually means low well. So, um, so if you have a large inductive load, a kind of inductive load that would draw large current, Without this corrective capacitor here, um, a lot of the current will be forced to, to go through, let's say, resistance of power transmission line, and you'll be wasting a lot of power. And, um, and it's uh, at power efficient to correct that. The way is uh, install a capacitor bank near the inductors or near the motors, or if it's a smaller device, sometimes uh, these corrective capacitors are just built into the device. And uh, that'll, that limits the amount of current that flows on the main branch while preserving the current that does need to flow through the inductor for it to do whatever it is it does, if it's a motor, you know, spin. So, um, so this is a, a, one of the things that, um, that electrical engineers um, figure out. And um, with the use of complex impedances, the, some of the considerations that go into that is something that we can work out for ourselves uh, with use of impedances and the knowledge that power is only dissipated in the register. So even though there's large current uh, flowing through the inductor and capacitor, those we don't worry about because no power is dissipated in the inductor and capacitor. So oh, I guess I went 70 minutes over than what I thought I was gonna do uh, 45 minutes ago. So, <laughs> Um, so that's, uh, I think, uh, the discussion of uh, power dissipated in AC circuits with um, kind of everything that I needed to talk about, both uh, starting from the review of the power dissipated in circuits and um, how that applies to power dissipated in AC circuits with some caveats about mathematical operations that you might consider doing with the complex numbers, how you should be careful even when you are squaring a complex function because you get a wrong result. <laughs> you just have to be careful. And uh, with the derivation of this formula that allows you to use complex numbers for some expressions that involve squares as long as you promise to do a time average later. And uh, we, we did that, we looked at how um, you can get power, well, um, you know, um, 
we did that. We well looked at this. Um, we discussed the uh, uh, voltage and the current through inductor and how plotting it out will tell you that average power dissipated inductor is zero and how that is consistent with our intuition and um, how in an inductor register circuit, uh, you can figure out, calculate the power dissipated in register. So here the inductor does play some role. It does uh, limit the amount of current that flows and that does affect how much power is dissipated in the register. But the thing that you have to be careful here is that the actual dissipation itself still only happens in the register. That's why this uh, expression is important. The inductance, what it does affect is this value of I. So it does indirectly um, affect the power dissipated in the register by affecting how much current to, has to flow through the circuit. And that's where um, something like a power factor correction is a thing because presence of this capacitor Again, capacitor doesn't, it doesn't even store net energy and it doesn't, and it doesn't dissipate any power. But what this presence of capacitor does is it affects how much current must flow through the circuit for the operation of the inductor. And that in the end ends up affecting how much power is eventually dissipated through the register. Yeah, I guess today I didn't quite talk about, get to talking about RMS explicitly and I think I'm out of steam here. I don't want to talk about RMS. I'll just leave it here. The, um, the value of RMS uh, values usually come in applications dealing with the power. And the reason for that is when you're dealing with the average power, expressions like this come up a lot where you square and then average. So because RMS is, you know, root mean square, meaning you squared and you took the mean and then you took square root. So when you take the RMS quantity and you square it, then you get something that's your, you know, square and then average. So, uh, so that's where, that's why you see the acronym RMS quite a bit, especially when you start dealing with the things that have to do with the power, energy. Uh, we could have actually talked about RMS when we were de dealing with the kinetic, kinetic theory of gas, because when you deal with the RMS speed, that RMS speed is what you use to relate directly to kinetic energy. So yeah, let me just leave that there. Um, and I guess we're relevant to your cities again, no. because it, you know, because RMS values relate to power and power energy happens to be a very useful concept in physics and engineering and other sciences.